you a symposium on the commemoration of World Refugee Day 2022, sponsored by Strong Foundation. Now, Refugee Day is celebrated globally on the 20th of June, and every single year there is a theme for it. The theme for this year is really seeking for the human right. While refugees are seeking for help, wherever it is they're seeking help from, and wherever it is that they've come from to seek for that help. That's really pretty much the summary of what we're going to be looking at and our main topic this afternoon is seeking safety is a human right for refugees seeking safety is a human right for refugees and of course my panelists are very capable people to talk about refugees especially with the current influx in uganda that we are experiencing with our neighbors the drc in congo over the past week we've had refugees to the tune of about six thousand people that are crossing from the other side into bunagana into uganda and of course affecting the population and the settlement areas as well as the host communities on the western side of Uganda. But as we get to deep into the deep of this conversation, I am joined on my immediate left, Mr. Mawa Alatawa, who's the program manager, humanitarian programs at Community Empowerment for Rural Development. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Mawa. Thank you, Mark. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And then next to him, I do have Mrs. Kamoga May, who is with Strong Foundation as the Region Programs Manager. Good afternoon to you, Mrs. Kamoga. Good afternoon, Priscilla. You're most welcome. Thank you. I will start with Mr. Mawa. Under the programs management, humanitarian programs, I believe you get to look at refugees directly. Now, let's first by understanding who are refugees and from which countries is Uganda receiving refugees right now? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Kalibala. A refugee is somebody who has fled their country, which may be due to war, conflict, persecution. The persecution could be racial, could be ethnic, could be religious, and they are forced to leave their country and seek safety in another country. Now, for somebody to qualify as a refugee, one, the person must cross an international border. That means you move from one country to another. But also, too, in Ugandan context, refugee status is granted by OPF in that if somebody is uh, displaced from their country, they automatically do not become refugees. They have to seek for protection from the government of Uganda under the mandate of OPM. And it is OPM to profile these people, and they are given the refugee status. The profiling takes is, is a process. In that process, the most the important uh, factor to consider is uh, the drivers for this person to cross to the other country, and then also the kind of protection uh, that they are seeking in the country where they're taking refugee. And once the state of this person is verified and profiled, then the OPM uh, grants this person refugee status and they are documented and are given uh, documents to that regard. Uh, for the households, they are given what is called attestation. Under the attestation, the household head is uh, considered as the head of that family plus the family members and the photographs of the family members appear on this card. Then for uh, individuals who are above 16 years old, they are given the refugee identification card and uh, this card is what now qualify somebody to be a refugee. Uh, currently, Uganda is receiving refugees uh, from uh, almost all the neighbors, but the countries that have uh, dominated in terms of uh, uh, protracted crisis that has displaced so many people are South Sudan, where we have so many refugees right now uh, settled in West Nile. Then we also have the current crisis in uh, DRC, the, the, the northern part of Ituri, which has uh, displaced people in uh, the, the districts of Kisoro. Mm -hmm. However, we also have refugees. You know, Uganda has a very rich history of hosting refugees. Actually, the first refugees in Uganda were hosted in the 1940s, the Polish refugees who fled the Nazi uh, extermination from from Europe, and that is how the history started. And from that time, Uganda has been hosting refugees throughout. We had the 1950 in Sudan, where over 80,000 refugees fled to Uganda. Then we also had the Rwanda genocide, where so many people crossed to Uganda, plus the Somali, Burundi, mm -hmm. Ethiopia, Eritrea. So all these countries currently have refugees, including Kenya, by the The Kenya, the, the elections of 1997, that crisis, people, some of the 
displaced people are still remained in Uganda as refugees. So by large, yeah, the most of the uh, countries bordering Uganda how people displaced and they are hosted in Uganda. And this is by large due to our good policy of when helping refugees to seek protection here and also the good political stability and the economic benefits that refugees who stay here benefit from the country. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Mawa Atalao, who's the Programs Manager, Humanitarian Programs at Community Empowerment for Rural Development. And then also joining us for this conversation, trying to dissect Seeking Safety, a Human Right for Refugees, is Honorable Esther Anyakun. Good afternoon to you, Honorable Esther. Good afternoon. You are most welcome. Thank you. And we are still trying to understand. Uh, we have Mr. Mawa here who is explaining to us who a refugee is and, uh, you know, the refugee status that we have here in Uganda. And so continuing with you, Mr. Mawa, we know that there are types of refugees that we have received over the years here in Uganda settlements. So could you please break down for us the types of refugees that we have in Uganda? Yeah, thank you so much. In Uganda, uh, Uganda is a unique uh, refugee management uh, approach in that we settle our refugees in settlement camps and like in most countries where refugees are taken into camps and uh, this is largely due to the uh, the policy of Uganda so it is assumed that by the time refugees uh, seek safety in, in Uganda they come when they do not have property they come when they are traumatized they come when they they, they, they have they have lost the hope so to ensure that there is holistic uh, manager on these refugees that are put in settlement and uh, for those few refugees who feel they are able to stay in urban areas the government uh, equally allow them to stay in urban areas and they're called urban refugees mm -hmm. but they still have the same status so those are the two different types of refugees we have in Uganda the urban refugees uh, stay mostly in uh, rural areas, majority stay in Kampala, but also now the current cities have that host refugee areas, you see the urban refugees, but the status and all these remains the same as the other refugees, the entitlement and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll turn to the Minister for State of State for Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Refugees. We do have the refugee policy here in Uganda, and by far it's been regarded as one of the best policies globally. You get to look at it being self-reliant in terms of implementation. So with the self-reliancy policy that we have and the refugee influx that we're experiencing just in 2022 with what's happening in South Sudan as well as what's happening in DRC, what is the government's policy on refugees? refugees and how is the uh, government actually implementing it now? Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> good evening viewers. So far Uganda has one of the best uh, open door policies, one of its kind and it's one of the best practices that we have in the world. Why do I say this? Because many countries are coming to do bench benchmarking in Uganda to see how we are implementing it and how also it is really practical for it to be able to accommodate and also to have refugees to be at peace and also uh, how the government is, is, uh, is running the show to make sure that the policy is well uh, capitalized and also, uh, and also how the refugees feel comfortable with the policy. But so far, Uganda has uh, over 1.6 1, 1 million asylum seekers and refugees in the country. And all of them are in settlements uh, kind of approach. Just as uh, our, my colleague had said here, you look at other countries, people are still staying in camps. If you look at a place, for example, in Kenya, a place called Kakuma, they're in a, a Kambi, they are co ca cocooned in one place. But for Ugandan policy, allows them to mix and coexist together with the environment and also, I mean, with the, with, with the co, 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 co coexist together with the host community. And this one also brings that peace. Now, this policy has also allowed us to have so many of the organizations, partners, uh, donor, donor funds. For example, I give you Dr. D Project. It gives a lot of uh, support to both the host community uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and the refugees. So this brings unity. It brings kind of uh, uh, practical, practical living and coexistence between the, the refugees and also with the host community. But so far we have... Um, some challenges that we, we, we as the, the government of Uganda are seeing through our coordination uh, as the office of the Prime Minister, the issue of environment. 
both the refugees and together with the host communities depend on fuel wood and also they use the same environment uh, for, for their housing. This is a very big challenge from down the grassroots, the local governments have raised it. Us also as government of Uganda, we are realizing that there's a lot of pressure being caused by the, 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 the deforestation and also we need as much as possible to conserve the, 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 the forests and also the environment of Uganda due to the pressure caused by these refugees. The influx are ongoing but the increasing numbers when we settle them in the existing uh, settlements so the pressure is going on and on and and we believe even this policy is being is not is is, is being uh, implemented but we as government right now we are feeling pressure out of the, the open door policy that we, we, we are implementing. Okay. Uh, we also want to find out, the government did implement the interagency contingency plan. Right now, of course, in April, beginning of April, we had the emergency plan for Uganda 1 uh, being declared. Now where we stand right now, we are at emergency level 2, which means that with the influx that is coming in from uh, the region, we may be heading to level 3. So how is the government actually ensuring that this uh, contingency plan is going to work out sooner than later. I will, I will be. I want to appreciate that for sure. We are now at level two, and the influx is really at uh, the, the, the graph is going higher and higher on air on a daily basis. I give you an example. Today alone, we received 529 asylum seekers just today. When I say we received them, they come from the border post. They go through screening, screening through the the, the transit center, and that's what we have right now. We have over 35,000. Uh, persons of concern at the holding center, 35,000. So when, when, we, when, when we look at what, what, we, uh, what, we, uh, what we are what we are doing right now in terms of uh, the, 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 the preparations, we know, for example, when the forces that the East African community is coming up with will go into DRC Congo to start uh, uh, fighting the, the, the rebels or trying to bring sanity and tranquility in the region. The, the influx number is going to shoot timers higher and higher. So we have been advocating and having meetings with our donors. I had a meeting on Tuesday with, with, my don with the donors and also the, the ambassadors to see, okay, what should we do? We should get prepared for this. Mm -hmm. We need more holding centers. We need more transit centers to be open. We need more land because right now we, the land that was allocated by land through the open door policy still is not enough to settle these people. But then, a week ago I was in Europe, I'd gone for a, uh, for a mission to do a resource mobilization. I went to Brussels, and the, I mean to Denmark first, but there was a positive kind of reception, and they really said, you came at the right time. I also went to The Hague, that's in Netherlands, they were very appreciative, they said you came at the right time. And also in Brussels. In Brussels. So, all these countries that I visited are saying, it's good Uganda is also, should be remembered. We went to do a wake-up call because it's like all the resources and all their attention is facing into the Ukraine. What about Uganda? There's an emergency going on in Uganda as well as going in Ukraine. So should we forget because the refugee issue is an international burden. It's not a Ugandan burden. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to knock at doors to the donors that, hey, hey, wake up. Can you please <laughs> double your env envelopes and see how we should be able to support these people and be able to resettle them right now? Because right now I need, uh, the country needs more than uh, around $800 million dollars to be able to handle the current uh, emergency and also the normal recurrent activities that are going on in, in, in the response. So it's a very, very big, big challenge that we are, we are not yet prepared for, for, for what the, the, the current, the, whatever is going to add on when, when we have the, 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 the soldiers being taken to, to DRC Congo. And even right now what we have, it's too much for us. 35,000 human beings in one place, sleeping on rubber holes. The behaviors of activities that are going on in that um, the holding center, if you go there, you'll even develop headache. Mm -hmm. They are cooking eight metric tons through WFP daily. So imagine how much fire would Which leads to pollution of air. Thank and you. then, of course, it's encroaching on the land, the trees, the forest so around. So the LC5 chairman yeah. of Kisoro told me they use around 79 metric tons daily of firewood to cook the food for the refugees. That's a very, very big challenge. So what are we doing? to make sure that if these trees are being cut from the forest, so how many more trees are we plant, replanting to make sure that we are everywhere? And that replacement part of it is not there. So it is a very serious uh, degradation issue 
and we feel we should do something as government together with also our development, part our development partners. This is why we are advocating for more funding and more resource envelopes to all our donors. Okay, all right. And, and with that kind of pressure that you have mentioned, one, of course, uh, you're looking at forestry. It's being affected. You're looking at land itself. There's encroachment on land, but also this land was meant to be doing something else. Now it is having to encumber that number of people. And then you've also talked about the fact that they have to cook, which means they need water. But what is the safety of the water that they are using right now? All these questions actually arise out of your submission. And then it begs the question, who are the partners that have already come on board right now to help with this contingency plan? As we talk right now, we have over 19 uh, partners who are, in, in, who are inside the response, leave alone the, the donors and so forth. But on the issue of water, we have organizations that are really handling the issue of wash. For example, um, for example, uh, Red Cross, Uganda Red Cross has, has provided a 10,000 uh, water tank in the center where these people are supposed to uh, be accessing water. And then, the, and then also uh, national water is also providing water for this people for consumption. So you can imagine how much water is being used on a daily basis. A normal person, I think, is supposed to use around 50? 30 liters. 30 liters? Mm, minimum uh, 15 liters. Ma minimum day. 15 liters per day. That's per person. Per, per person. person yes. So multiplied by the 35,000 that is in the country right now. That is now. in the country right now. In the, not even in the holding center. Yeah. In the holding center. So the, then when you look at now the issue of deforestation, they are cutting wood mm -hmm. for, for, for making their, um, their rubber, rubber houses where they're staying right now. Although WFP and also UNHCR provided us with rubber holes which are already fabricated. Yes, but they're not enough. So there are those ones who have increased and we're decongesting now by putting some other small tents, especially for the male and also the elderly to be staying away. But the rate at which the firewood is being used is really, really, really very worrying. Mm -hmm for us as a country. Okay, all right. I've not had you mention sanitization because if you have uh, that big a number uh, of foreign people on one land, a piece of land, and they definitely are having diseases. Uh, we have seen the outbreak of Ebola on that on the other side of Congo mm -hmm. in uh, since last year. And now you bring in people who you have not really checked in terms of disease control. But then again, they are all in one place. That means sanitization is also at risk right now, especially for the vulnerable groups, children, mothers. Actually, at the moment, out of the, six, uh, the 35,000 people, 60% of them are children. Now, the partners that we are working with together with, uh, with the government of Uganda and, and UNHCR, there is no way you can be admitted into the camp before going through screening. Mm -hmm. They are doing medical screening. They are also doing um, COVID tests. They are doing all those screenings that are being done just in case you also have other infections. Like, for example, we have two cases of the monkey monkeypox. Monkeypox. Mm -hmm. Up to now, we are still waiting for results from the Ministry of Health to see whether it is really monkeypox and those people have been isolated. So we do it. There is no way you can access the, 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 the transit center or even the holding center without you being go, going through, because we have an international uh, uh, medicines frontier. We have some organizations that are doing that, those, those, those services. So those services, out of the 19 uh, partners that we have, at least most of them are also holding issues of health. So that one is handled as, as much as, as well as the issue of wash. Wash is handled. We have pit latrines and also we have running water, only that controlling people. So every time we find when they have littered around, so they try to clean. So there's general cleaning, and we also have security around to make sure that they don't do a lot of a lot of GBV, for example, issues, and also, you know, you, you know what it means by putting people in the same in the same place. So at least there is they have segregated where men are staying, women are staying, children are staying, and through the security forces, we are able to to, to really maintain peace and also uh, peaceful living within the within the, the camp. All right, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Esther Nyakun. Uh, she has painted for us the picture right now of the 35,000 that are in holding on the western side of Uganda, rece being received from the DRC medley. And of course, their impact on environmental, which has talked about, you know, water, sanitation, uh, forestation, and land itself in terms of how it's being used and uh, the impact of it in terms of pollution and also safety as well as health of the people that are 
being kept in one place and with such a big number. Now, of course, it reminds you of the stories that we have been doing at NTV, some of them in Kasese, the settlement caps in Kasese, and the impact of that on the riverbanks in Kasese when it comes to the rainy seasons. <laughs> because of encroachment on these properties and these pieces of land, you get to see that now nature is being redirected to go elsewhere, which then affects and uh, it responds in a hazardous way. But that's where disaster preparedness comes in. So we do have all these pressures that come with hosting refugees here in Uganda. But Strom Foundation has come up with initiatives, programs and projects that can actually aid in easing settlement of these refugees. Here to talk to us from Strom Foundation is Mrs. Kamuga May, who is the program's regional manager with Strom Foundation. What is Strom Foundation's work with the refugees currently? Thank you so much, Priscilla. For the sake of our viewers, I'll first uh, tell you who we are. Astromi Foundation is a rights-based uh, development organization that works to uh, fight poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our effort to fight for poverty, we strengthen communities, a civil society, but also we ensure quality, inclusive education mm. and lifelong learning, and also ensure economic inclusion and empowerment for the vulnerable uh, groups. Astromi Foundation globally works in three regions, <coughs> that is Asia region and West, West Africa region, and East Africa region where we have a, a regional office in Kampala. And specifically in East Africa, we work in Uganda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and Kenya. Now back to Uganda, where we work with uh, refugee communities, we work in West Nile. And in West Nile, we work through local organizations and uh, where we have CEFOD, uh, that is a community effort for rural development. We have RICE, Rural Initiative for Community Empowerment, and Palm Corps. And in all our work, we don't work in isolation and only with our partners, but we work with OPM, and um, <coughs> we work with the UNHCR and other actors. And also in our work, we've, uh, we have adopted the consortium approach where we, we work in consortiums with other actors like mm -hmm. ADRA, Y Global, but also Plan International. And uh, specifically what we have done in, uh, in the refugee communities, um, under education, we've, uh, together with our local partners, we've ensured that children are prepared for primary school. And even at a time when the schools were closed, we didn't go to sleep. What, uh, what happened is that uh, our partners initiated what we call community-based uh, learning. And uh, they were also able to procure solar radios that the children were able to use, you know. They had a lot of rhymes, they had a lot of lessons, recorded lessons for them. And these uh, the, the lessons on the, on the solar radios were also help, able to help the teachers uh, to, you know, to support the learning of the children. And also, they've done a few renovations of the ECD centers and also training uh, caregivers and the center management uh, committees. And um, under lifelong learning, that is the non-formal education, we work with out-of-school adults and boys and girls uh, to uh, skill them in the life skills, but also to give them vocational skills to help them cope with life and, and the, the stress that they've been through. So <coughs> what happens after the training, like for example last year, today I can say that the youth are able to engage in self, you know, they can do their self, I mean mm -hmm. self-employment, they're able to use the skills that they acquired. And uh, also, we don't only stop at the youth, but also, I mean uh, the adolescents, but we also engage out of school youths. This is the age of uh, 20, maybe to 25, and also skill them with life skills, but also vocational skills. And women, we have not forgotten women and men. Mm -hmm. And here they, they engaged in uh, uh, savings and also uh, borrowing from their own savings to start small income generating activities to support their families. And uh, to date, um, since 2019, when we started working in Paralinia, a refugee camp, we've been able to reach over 1,900 uh, children and over 1,800 adolescent girls and boys, over 1,200 women and men, and 300 youth. 2022, 
we receive no funding. Maybe what I didn't mention that all our work in the refugee communities is uh, uh, supported by the Norwegian government through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and through the uh, Norwegian Embassy here in Kampala, but also through um, other actors, I mean th other donors like AK4 Kofo Foundation, and we also have now uh, Educate a Child where we have a new project that is coming in called Rising. Uh, so 2022 we are looking at reaching over 4,600 children, both in early childhood development but also in primary education. And these are children who don't have access to school, don't have access to, to, to education. Some have even been enrolled but actually don't come to school because of reasons, uh, maybe best known to their parents. And this is what we are going to dig into and ensure that they actually all can come back to school. But uh, a lot has been happening in the camps over the years since 2019 and uh, we have a lot of hope that lives are going to be changed and in all the work that we do we integrate psychosocial support uh, like uh, honorable minister said like uh, mawa said uh, most of these people come when they are traumatized they don't have hope they've lost parents they've lost wives they've lost you know siblings and they look like there's no hope for them. But the integration of psychosocial support in whatever we do has brought hope because then they know that somebody cares, somebody is ready to listen to me, and together we can find a solution uh, to some of the problems. All right, you have talked about the Palorinia camp, the, uh, the settlement, yes. and I know that you're having three particular projects that yes. are targeting the vulnerable groups in Uganda. Vulnerable groups would include the children, um, mothers, and then, of course, the youth. You do have the youth-led empowerment initiative that yeah. is functional there right now. You also do have the program for education, advocacy, counseling, e economic empowerment, which is known as PEACE. And then there's one for PESAS, which is program for adolescents and children education, as well as social empowerment all those that are actively running tell us about these particular three programs uh, when they were incepted uh, what are the numbers that are currently under these different programs and then what their status is right now okay I'll start with the pieces I mean the peace project that is a program for education advocacy and uh, empowerment uh, this one uh, we first had an initial pro one-year project last year which was very successful and this again is funded by the Norwegian government through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Norwegian Embassy here in Kampala. Um, and now we've gotten an extra fund for two years mm -hmm. that will run. And we are in need with the, the consortium with ADRA and Y Global. And uh, we are targeting 600 children, Astromi Foundation with our local organization, I mean partners. Though also Y Global and ADRA also have a different target. But also we'll be targeting the out of school boys and girls with life skills and uh, vocational skills, but also youth with life skills and vocational skills and women so that they can save and also borrow from their own savings. And the component of psychosocial support is very strong and, it, and uh, integrated into this program. So a lot of several community counselors will be trained and also will be able to establish, um, we call them psychosocial support centers, where somebody can come in private and talk to a counselor, and especially our <coughs> young girls who have gone through a lot of uh, sexual and gender domestic Especially violence. Especially in the last two years, the yes. teenage pregnancies yes. have been so high exactly. in terms of the police reports that came out 2020, 2021, even 2020, exactly. the numbers exactly. are still high. Exactly. So this is, a, uh, this is an avenue to reach out to the hearts and the emotional life of these people so that they can gain resilience and self-confidence and self-esteem to move on with, uh, with life. And the second project, PACES, this is funded by AKO Foundation, and it has a special interest in um, a school program. We have a very interesting program for the out-of-school adults and girls and boys that we call bonga. Bonga is a Swahili word which means let's talk, because it's mm -hmm. a youthful word, you know, and the youth say let's bonga and those kind mm -hmm. of things. So why we, we wanted to appear, I mean to appeal to the young people. And uh, here, under the AKO Foundation, the focus is on bonga in school because the community bonga, the community bonga is really to support the girls that have dropped out because of early pregnancy, early marriages, mm -hmm. and every kind of other associated problems that come with, uh, 
uh, being an adolescent. But the one for Bonga in school is to help the children to stay actually in school, to prevent uh, dropping out. So here we have the Bonga clubs where the girls I mean, talk about menstrual issues, but also they are trained in life skills and they have a patron or a teacher who has been trained to conduct, uh, to oversee the clubs. So they talk a lot about issues of menstruation, uh, sanitation, uh, personal hygiene, uh, rights, and um, why I should stay in school, the value of education, and all that. And uh, one issue that has been disturbing many girls is when they're in their menstrual period, when there's no support, when they're stigmatized. So this program is helping I mean the children, boys and girls to appreciate what girls go through on a, a monthly basis and even when the girls are being trained on making reusable sanitary pads, the boys are involved why? Because we want them to know that it is okay, it is okay, this is a normal process mm -hmm. for every girl and you, this is your sister, you need to support her at a time like this. Or when she goes into a changing room, don't be inquisitive and start, you know, wanting to say check. Simba Wakatiao, <laughs> how did you come to actually accept and implement certain ideology? Yes. Because in society up to date, yeah. even if it's in urban centers, mm. you get to see that these conversations of adolescence are given separately. Yeah. The girls are in a separate room, the boys are in a separate room. Yeah. So there's no shared information. And therefore, attention from both sides is of inquisitive of mm, that's mm -hmm. what you go through and the, it comes with <laughs> bullying and teasing and things like that exactly. so why did you choose to go that direction mm. as strong okay we realized over over the years and with the research we've been making with our communities we realized that parents and even teachers shy away from such topics so they leave the girl to decide, I mean, to, to, to get information from elsewhere. And many times, because the girls are not informed, when they come to their menstrual period, they, they tend to shy away and miss school. You know, missing school four days in a, a month times the terms. That's, those are so many days that a girl will lose out. So we, we found out that most of the girls are stigmatized by boys because the boys don't understand what is this, why do we see blood on your mm. dress. So involving boys in this kind of uh, intervention is very helpful because then they get to understand, to appreciate, and know that, okay, my sister, my, my fellow student, every four, ma every four days in a month will have to go through this, and it is okay, it's a normal process. I'll, you know, I don't have to make fuss, a fuss over it, and, but also for the teachers to be free to talk about these issues. And uh, maybe one other thing I didn't mention is that in all our programs, there's a lot of male involvement now. Mm -hmm. uh, before, you know, men, how they wouldn't come for PTA meetings, they mm -hmm. don't come for school days, they feel it's only a women thing. But um, in all our programs, we are beginning to involve the men so that they have a sense of ownership and they have a buy-in into our programs. And, and what uh, has been the impact of the men's involvement, one to the side of men, yes. and then also to the side of the psychology of the children? Um, men are picking up that because now they realize that actually this is my responsibility, this is my child. This is not for the school, it is mm -hmm. not a child of Seford, it's not a child of uh, Stromy Foundation, but my child and I must be a father and a figure father, an example to this child, if this child is to become, out, to become a good adult in the future. So the men, we, are, we call them Baba Clubs, they come together to discuss issues about uh, school reintegration but also being able to make sure that children are, are staying in school, school retention and also completion. And it has been very helpful because normally children fear fathers. So when they know that my father is involved in my school work, comes to check with the teachers, I must be in school. <coughs> I don't stay behind picking mangoes and finding excuses. But also the children feel that yes, now I have a father who cares about my education. So psychologically, it pushes them to stay in school because my father is also concerned. Hmm. Yes, Mr. Mawa, uh, father's shying away from responsibility, <laughs> but with Baba Project in the settlements, I know you've had an experience of that. Uh, from your perspective as a man and as a father, what do you feel has been the impact of uh, projects like Baba towards the men in the settlements? Yeah, thank you, Madam Priscilla. The Baba sessions have really helped inclusive learning environment in that just like uh, May uh, intimated, parents have taken out the parental role to support their children and also uh, provide the 
the necessary support to these children when they are going to school. Uh, initially, looking at the setup uh, for the refugee and house community setup, most of the the the, the 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 caring for the children has been left in the hands of women and these women over stressed with the domestic activities stressed with the other activities so at the end most of these children are left on their own mm -hmm. but now the mailing uh, involvement has uh, uh, one created a, an impact on the men that actually these children are theirs and they owe that responsibility to ensure that the children and have a safe learning environment but also to the children, they, they check their books mm. to ensure that these children are performing well and they are able to ask questions. And the impact is that when a father follows a child up to the school and inquires from the school management why the performance is poor, it's different from the way if the mother did the same. Mm. So in that way, the learning environment has improved, but also the career, uh, we call it career realignment of these children has improved a lot. So now we, we, we encourage the young girls to look at what the previously has been a thought as a male kind of thing, that what a man can do, actually a woman can do. Yes. So when a, a, a male figure comes, especially uh, in, 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 in the care of a, a girl child, the girl aspires to be like the father. Mm -hmm. And this has now allowed us to encourage more girls to take uh, trades or take skills development entities that original was a prison for the men. That's why now you see the women carpenters, you see the women builders, you see the women plumbers. Uh, traditionally, uh, a, girl, a girl child who aspires to be like that is see like, this is a cowboy, this is this. So the other girls even isolating them. So this involvement has helped. Another area where it has helped a lot is to do with the GPV, the mm -hmm. gender-based violence. Uh, we may now sit together to plan, mm -hmm. but also sit together to make a decision at family level. And this has now allowed the, uh, the, the home to have peace in that most of these women who were involved in the savings groups initially used to do savings from what the Kameza, what the money gives <laughs> for, for, for to provide for the home. Yet they make savings and they end up saving their kids. And this has resulted into a, a massive domestic violence. Mm -hmm. But when the male involvement was brought and these men now sat down and they looked at what actually the woman does at home is part of who. The, the, the home economics and therefore the man should be involved and this has now resulted into a reduction in the gender based violence in, in the communities but also in terms of undertaking uh, social you know, economic enterprises. You know most of the refugee enterprises are what we call these roadside businesses and this has been the preserve of the women and uh, when COVID came in most of these enterprises were affected because of uh, the SOPs that were in place and also the restrictions on the movements and this forced the men now to look at alternative live resources mm -hmm. and the only alternative uh, live resource was to now sit with the women and also partake in uh, the, the bonga sessions, partake in uh, the vocation sessions. So there is now holistic uh, uh, empowerment at household level and also there is now some element of residence building uh, in these households where the project is. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Mao. We are having a discussion. Seeking safety is a human right for refugees. And the common denominator in all the ladies and gentlemen seated here is the fact that they deal with refugees directly. Honorable Esther Anya Kuhn, who's the State Minister for Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Refugees, has given us and painted for us the picture currently in the western side of Uganda, where we're looking at 35,000 refugees in one holding and more coming she has told us 6,000 have been registered uh, just entering within this week and so it's a lot of pressure mounting especially on the environment next to her mrs kamoga who works with strong foundation as a regional programs manager has talked to us about how they have through storm focused on the vulnerable groups the children the adolescents the youth and the women but also bring in the element of the support system such as the baba project that they have 
where they encourage the men to be a part of education and livelihood and enhancement as well as empowerment of those that are living within settlements. They focus in uh, Palorinia Refugee Settlement, which is in West Nile, Western Nile region in Uganda. And of course, Mr. Mao with Seaford, who is uh, managing uh, also in the humanitarian programs that they handle in Seaford. Now, all this comes down to the fact that on the 20th of June, we are celebrating World Refugee Day. But we want you to understand what is World Refugee Day from their perspective. I'll start with you, Mr. Mao. What is World Refugee Day? Yeah, thank you. Uh, World Refugee Day is uh, an international day that has been designated by the United Nations uh, to celebrate the lives of refugees. Uh, it's celebrated every 20th of June. And unfortunately for the case of Uganda, for the last two years, it has been celebrated virtually. For the refugees in the community, the world refugees, they're Christmas. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they prepare, they actually take a lot of time to prepare for this world refugee day. Uh, most of the considerations for celebrating this world refugee day is emanating from the fact that refugees go through a lot, right from uh, transition to to seeking the refugee in another country, getting used to getting acquainted to a new country with the new laws, with the new everything. And th this, this, this is really a lot for refugees. But over the years, it, uh, we, have, we have seen that most refugees have been able to overcome the challenges and are able to uh, build their self-reliance. Actually, if you went to the settlements now, you will be shocked to hear that some of the refugees are not willing to go back mm -hmm. to their countries of origin. And the Ugandan law is clear. Repatriation is voluntary. You don't force anybody to go back. So that means uh, the refugees who have built their resilience very well are not comfortable with the Ugandan way of life. Let me say the Ugandan culture. And are willing to stay here. And uh, celebrating the day gives them that impetus that people actually recognize in them. Mm. They are human beings just like any other person. And uh, therefore, they feel they are part of the community. And uh, they also deserve uh, that protection that is being given to them. It's not a choice, but it's rather something that is by, by dignity they deserve from the humanitarian point of view. So by large, that is the Christmas uh, for the refugees in, in, in Uganda and it's celebrated globally. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, all right. I will turn to the minister. With this theme, seeking safety being a human right for refugees, but then the refugees are encroaching, or settlements are encroaching on the environment that we have. How is the office of the prime minister going to match the two things, giving them the right to seek for safety, but then again also protecting the environment? Thank you very much. Um, Generally, the Office of the Prime Minister is a coordination um, a body for all the refugee response. And through that, we work hand in hand with all the partners. Uh, for example, uh, Strom Foundation, we've been working very close with them on, 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 on what they're doing. So we go on monitoring also. We have people down there in the field uh, like that. that the, we have over 500 staff from the Office of the Prime Minister who monitor what all the partners are doing down in the field in terms of having rights for refugees, in terms of environment, implementation, all the activities, because the donors give them money in, 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 in their programs to be able to do, to, to, to achieve some of these things. And also we have legal teams who are giving the people, um, uh, we have legal teams in the office of the Prime Minister who are helping us to be able to settle up issues that are pertaining rights of refugees between them with the host community or within the settlements of the, of the refugees. And then the other thing also, we have protection. We have the police in each settlement. This is what the office of the Prime Minister has done through the government of Uganda to provide pro uh, protection in all all settlements to be able to give them uh, uh, protection first of all and also security to know that they are protected and all their rights are also right to eat right to sleep because right to education because when you look at most of these uh, services that for example Uganda gave in terms of its pledges we have they have rights to education they have rights to work 
and they also have rights to, to, to health services in, in Uganda. So all those pledges were, 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 were part, of, part of the pledges is also protection, that is that security for refugees. So this, we achieved them through the office of the Prime Minister, uh, when I talk about the legal part of it and also the, the security that we provide and the, and the teams. Uh, deployed down to work together with all the partners. So, and then the partners, we have a, quite a good number of partners that are really giving, uh, implementing these services through all the funding that they're getting from, from the donors in terms of um, uh, grants or loans or wh whatever money they, they, they get. But at least we see and we appreciate. I totally want to repeat it again that I appreciate what they've just mentioned here and it's for real because I've been, I've been with them and I've gone through all the, the concept, uh, uh, what the program of, of, of Strong Foundation, what they're doing and I really appreciate it that, that yeah, the issue of psychological support is, 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 is the right. Right to all the basic needs like food, accommodation, shelter and so forth is all right and we know the government of Uganda could not be able to do all those if it was not for the good, the good uh, will of our partners to be able to do that. So through the coordination, the uh, Office of the Prime Minister is, is able uh, to, to, to achieve uh, those, those, those uh, benefits of the rights and also the protection of the refugees and the settlements. Okay, all right. So we have established the theme is seeking uh, uh, seeking safety is a human right for refugees. Now, how is um, your ministry aligning with this year's theme in order to actually address the issues at hand and what are the expected uh, commemoration activities that we are having with the Office of uh, OPM around the World Refugee Day coming up? We have been uh, coordinating a program for, for tomorrow, uh, I mean for 20th June. This is a day because since uh, the COVID-19 had stopped, stalled the two years without us making a celebration. Yes, first of all, we want to thank all the partners that are boosting up the, the refugees to feel this is their day through all the, the support and also uh, the services they're giving them in terms of food and also they really have, they're going to have a good celebration. But the Office of the Prime Minister has been coordinating this was my initiative when I had my first, very first meeting uh, as a minister or on, on, on the CRRF day um, meeting. I said, why don't we be planting trees on the day of uh, World Refugee Day? Instead of being in office in an essay and you're celebrating the refugees are left out, we should touch and be close to their hearts when we go down to the field. So it is like something that I've requested all our partners all our, 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 our development partners, all our donors and also Office of the Prime Minister, we are all going to be out in the field on Monday. And we shall have the, 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 the occasion, it's going to be in a single district. Why did we zero out into a single district? Right now, all the new arrivals that are coming uh, into the country are being settled in, in a single district. That means the impact right now on the environment is more of on, on, on a single district. So we want to go and plant more trees in a single district as, as we celebrate the day. So I think on that day you'll be able to say, okay, this is what we meant. But so you'll have other partners also planting trees in Chisoro because all of them Chisoro is receiving a lot. Like, yeah. like, like uh, Strong Foundation is not in Western. Yeah. So they are going to do also tree planting in, 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 in West Nile, in BDBD, uh, in, in, in uh, Germany, all Palorinia, mm -hmm. right. Palabek. So the activities are, are in the, all the 13 districts. But this one of Kisor of uh, uh, Nachi Valley in Isingro is just like the main, the main uh, venue. But it, the activity is all around the, the okay. 13 districts implementation. Okay, all right. Strong Foundation, um, I know that you want to tackle this theme in respect of who these refugees are, mm -hmm. uh, where they're coming from, and what has led them to actually flee from their hosting nations to come and settle in uh, the settlements here in Uganda. And so how do you intend to amalgamate the theme and what your mission and vision is this year at Strong Foundation? Okay, basing on the, the theme this year for the World Refugee Day, uh, safety is a right while protecting the environment. Like I mentioned at the beginning that we are a rights-based organization and everything we do we use a rights-based approach. Uh, we whose principles are participation, empowerment, non-discrimination, transparency and accountability. And focusing on um, a participation and uh, empowerment and non-discrimination. For us it doesn't matter whether a refugee or not a refugee, coming from where or where, you are very important. They're all very important to us because they all have a right mm. to safety. They have a right to exist. They have a right to food and education. So we embrace everybody. It doesn't matter from where. And uh, 
And this year round, we are having, of course, we started with TV talk show. And also our partners will have radio talk shows and sports messages in, uh, in, West, in West Nile. They'll also have an environment run uh, where they're you know, you know, telling people about uh, planting trees. But also they'll have a youth, they call it a youth conference, which is a webinar. And also our youth that graduated uh, from vocational skills will make some displays of the things that they learned and what they are doing, uh, they are doing currently. And uh, one other thing uh, what that I want to really commend uh, the minister for is the tree planting. Because the Baba clubs I talked about have also been uh, trained to establish nursery trees. And these they will use to plant trees but also to sell as a way of getting an income. So environment management and climate change is key in all our programs and you'll also find that uh, we we are also planning to train the youth in what we call the green economy where they can recycle household waste to make briquettes in a way of reducing on the cutting down of trees because briquettes are really somebody can use them for for many hours and uh, it doesn't call for cutting down of trees you use what is uh, readily available from your house, maybe peelings or trash. You know, you are cleaning the environment, but also you are making uh, something that will is clean energy for, for society. Yeah. Okay, all right. Mr. Mao, Seaford has to celebrate World Refugee Day. What activities have you designed in order to commemorate this day? Yeah, for the World Refugee Day, just like the minister said, uh, this year's theme is aligned to environment protection. So most of our activities are aligned to protection of the <coughs> environment. Here we are planting seedlings uh, in, in Palorena and then Moyo district in Obongi, then also in Yumbe, Bidibidi. But also, that's like she said, we are implementing uh, most of the storm interventions in West Nile. So we are part of the organization of the youth uh, to engage that youth discourse uh, through the webinar and also the sports and all that. So. Uh, the, the, the core issue, when you look at the refugee setup, much as we are talking about refugee right now, the host community remains a very big factor in this. It's, it's an integrated uh, approach of management. But when you look at the rural areas that are hosting these refugees, the cheapest source of fuel is, is, is firewood, which is got by cutting down trees. And in most times, these trees that have been cut down have, are not replaced. And uh, therefore, I'd like to applaud the minister uh, for that initiative that mm. for this year, let's focus on environmental uh, protection by planting more trees. But also, under Seford, we have so many uh, d uh, in interventions that are designed to ensure that we protect the environment, especially when you look at uh, the community of Western Nile. 80% are subsistence farmers. Mm -hmm. And the farming is done by the way you wish. You wake up, you just do what you want to do your land. And we are saying, come on, this is not the way we need to do our farming. So we have now encouraged what we call the block farming, where we integrate a lot of expertise in terms of our community managed disaster risk reduction uh, strategies to ensure that people are able to conserve the land and able to also generate income, mm -hmm. but also have the triple effect of uh, agroforestry. And this has shown that it, it, it has already a very big impact when we started it and we are going to roll it out. We are going to showcase this during the World Refugee Day. And in the block farming, you know, most of the refugees do not have access to uh, adequate land. So the only way is to integrate the, the host community on a ratio of 50-50, so that when they form groups, 50% of the group is from the host and then the 50s from the free mm -hmm. so that there's free access to land okay. the only challenge with the free access to land has been this protection of the refugees because our uh, most arable lands are quite a uh, distance from the settlement mm -hmm. and that calls for a very uh, protected protection for these refugees especially the refugees who may be new to the country so okay. those are the issues that we are highlighting during right. the war refugee day thank in you Mr. Mao. The theme. Yes. all right uh, let me have closing remarks from the minister here Thank you very much. Uh, for sure, I just want to join uh, the rest of the the, 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 country, uh, the refugees in the world, uh, the refugees in Uganda, the 1.6 million refugees in Uganda will be part of this celebration and we shall join them definitely in the field. So I still appeal to all the partners out there to be 
who are in the refugee ref response to make sure that we all be in the field on that day. Mm -hmm. Let's get out of the AC, we go and fill the day together with the refugees. Mm -hmm. We enjoy and celebrate with them by also planting more trees in Uganda. We need to conserve and protect the environment uh, on, on all the refugee uh, land that, was, that has been provided by government. But even then, their celebration shows them that even though we are working with them, government is concerned and also all the partners are concerned about what is going on and we are also part of them. We, should, we have to show them love, a motherly love, and also be able to be together with them and embrace them on that, on that day. So I feel being that day, I'm not even going to attend cabinet, I have to be with the refugees because mm -hmm. I have been appointed to be to work for the refugees and I'm, I should be able to uh, be with the refugee refugees on that day. So, all right. uh, so I wish Kamuka. all the refugees <laughs> in the world a happy refugee, World Refugee Day yes. and especially my refugees who are in Uganda both mm -hmm. in urban and the settlements a happy uh, World Refugee Day. Okay, uh, Mrs. Kamoga, you had talked about a consortium that would actually be a enabling collection of funds to be able to settle the refugee issues. Uh, in your closing remarks. Yes. Um, and adopting the consortium approach in a way improves the quality of program implementation but also promotes learning and innovation. So as the government is looking for funds, I think it's very important for us actors, development actors, to work in a consortium, not in, a, in silos, mm. because then you pull more funds but also there's a lot of learning there's a lot of unlearning of things, of how things are done when it comes to refugees. So I'd really encourage all other development actors to go for the consortium approach. Okay. Yes. All right. We are thankful to the Office of the Prime Minister for focusing on refugees at such a time as this, uh, creating relief but also protecting the environment so that they can have a safe place, which is their human right for sure. And we're thankful for the partners in the aid of refugees, get, making sure that they have livelihood and the basic needs, which is food, water, shelter, education, safety. Uh, we do have Strong Foundation that has been uh, bringing you this talk show life and also in partnership with seafood that has been ensuring that humanitarian programs are activated in most of the settlements that we have in Uganda. Across 13 settlements is where you're going to be having the celebrations uh, happening on the 20th of June as we celebrate World Refugee Day. But at the, at the end of the day, anyone can seek protection, anyone can seek where they want to go, regardless of who they are and what they believe in. It is a non-negotiable. Seeking safety is a huge human right. Wherever they come from, people forced to flee should be welcomed. And so refugees can come from all over the globe and here in Uganda, we welcome them. We have been priding in 1.6 billion, but of course with the 35,000 that the minister has shared with us, that number is pushing forward. But Ugandans, we always have a good heart and a welcoming heart. So let's mm. continue to welcome them and create safe environments, especially with the hosting communities. It's been a very good discussion and I believe these submissions have enlightened you about the plight of refugees but on world refugee days we more so celebrate their strength their courage and their resilience thank you so much good day